Good morning and welcome to First Burger. We are glad to have you here to worship with us today, whether you're joining us in person or online. We want to thank you for being a part of our church family today. Well, if you are a visitor with us today, you'll notice in the seat backs in front of you, there are some connect cards. We would love for you to grab one of those connect cards and fill it out. Let us know that you're here. Also, if you have any prayer requests that we can come alongside you and pray with you, we would love to know about that. Our staff gathers together during the week. We pray for all the prayer requests turned in. So let us know how we can pray for you and your family today. Today is going to be an exciting day. We are going to worship together. We're going to hear the word from Pastor Charlie. And my favorite thing, we get to see a baptism today. So I am excited to see one of our young kids getting baptized. On our way to church this morning, my four-year-old said, Mommy, it's not baptism, it's baptism." because that's a bath up there. So our friend Banu is getting baptized today. If you would, please turn your attention to the baptistry. Hey. Well, good morning. It's my uh, privilege to present to you Bonapriya Macy Drake. And if you don't know her already, you're not from here, because she makes herself known wherever she goes. She's a wonderful, wonderful child, and she's my daughter, my youngest of... We've been praying for this day for seven years. <laughs> when we started the adoption process, she, Bonnie comes from a country where Christianity really isn't accepted. And we don't know what God has planned for her, but we know it's big. And we're excited for this day, and it's an answer to prayer, and it's, it's a big day. Banu, um, we've been talking, having this conversation for quite some time during vacation Bible school. She came up to Tia and said, let's do this. I'm ready for Jesus to be in my heart. And uh, when they talked and prayed, she said, uh, I want to get baptized on my birthday. That would be the best birthday present ever. So today, not only do we celebrate Banu Priya's 10th birthday, we get to celebrate her rebirth her new birth in the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ. And this is a special, special day. So, Bonnie, can you tell me, can you tell me who Jesus is? Um, it's, it's Jesus is, uh, who died for us and uh, it's uh, God's son. It's God's son who died for us, you're right. And so, Bonnie Priya, do you believe that Jesus died for our sin? Yes. Yes. And Bonnie, um, did you accept Jesus to be your Lord and your Savior? Yes. That means that you're going to let him be your boss. You good for that? Yes. yes. All right. Well, with your profession of faith this morning, and we're going to show all these people your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, it is my privilege, not only as your dad, but now your brother in Christ, to baptize you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. So, it's my privilege to baptize you. You're buried with Christ in death and risen to walk in a brand new life. Ooh, check that out. Awesome. Right, you right, Tia, if you could come up and pray for us. Made me tear up a little bit. I almost forgot to wave my, my rah-rah stick. <laughs> if y'all would, please bow your heads in prayer with me. Father God, we, we thank you for Banu. We thank you for her heart and just how she has run after you, how she has sought after you with that heart of a child, God. I thank you that you have called her to be your own. And uh, God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a part of her church family. God, we just ask that you are a part of every moment, not only of this service, but of our time together as a church family and of our time as we go out this week and share your love with others. God, I just ask that you make it a priority on every heart in this room that we share your love, just like Banu has talked about today, how she's been so brave to stand up here and say that you're her Lord. God, give us that same courage. 
Help us to share your love with others. God, be a part of our service today. In your name, amen. If you would, please turn your attention to our announcements. Good morning. Welcome to First Borger today. And thanks so much for spending part of your weekend with us. Here are a few things you need to know, so check it out. First Fun Nights are up and running, and we are already having a great time hanging out together. This week is the Sod Poodles game, and we are looking forward to a night at the ballpark. And on the second week of July, we will be bowling at Wildcats. We look forward to growing in relationship with each other as we hang out during First Fun Nights. June 30th, we will be hosting the Boots and Badgers Blood Drive for Coffee Memorial Blood Center in our fellowship hall. Donors receive a t-shirt, one wow pass to Wonderland Amusement Park, and the opportunity to bless someone in the need of blood. To schedule your time to donate, use the sign up at the Connect desk or contact the church office. There are many things going on here at First Border. As we look to what God is doing here at the church, our city, and throughout the world, we need you and the giftings that God has equipped you with as we steward what he is doing through us. We still have several committee openings, and we ask that you take time to pray and seek God about filling one of these positions. Ladies, July 9th, the women of First Burger will be taking a little road trip down south to the Creek House Honey Farm in Canyon, Texas. So ladies, save the date and look forward to having a fun day building and growing relationships as together we love God, love others, and make disciples. For more information about what's going on here at First Burger, check Facebook, firstburger.com, and grab a calendar at the entrances on your way out today. Thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. Well, good morning. Hope everybody's doing well. Wasn't it great to get up and see the ground wet? And boy, we praise God for that. Amen. Amen. We sure do. A couple quick things before we get started with the worship. I just wanted to touch base with you before, since we just saw the announcements. Next Sunday, immediately following the service, we're actually going to have a special church conference. We're not even going to leave the room. And the reason we're going to do that is we're going to go ahead and affirm or approve some of the folks that have already indicated they wanted to help serve on those committees. I was notified this morning by Dave Brandon that we have another person, Abair Morales, is willing to serve on our long-range planning committee. So that would give us one person for each of the three openings that we have. And so uh, we're going to go ahead and just take care of that next Sunday immediately following the service. There's a, a cut sheet over here that you guys have at all the exits that has those names on it. doesn't have a bear's name on there, but just pencil his name in there and just consider yourself notified that a bear Morales is willing to serve on our long range plan committee and we'll take care of that. Another thing I wanted to mention to you is the boots and badges blood drive. Now we were contacted a couple of months ago by the coffee Memorial blood center about the need of local churches and local organizations to participate. Now we know that we have the, 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 the blood drive at Johnson Center each uh, about every three or four months, whatever it is, but they want the churches to do that. And so we really need you guys to sign up. It's, it's by sort of appointment only. I think there's 15 available spots. It's this coming Thursday, the 30th from 3 to 6 p.m. So if you haven't had a chance to sign up yet, would you please contact the church office? Let Shauna know. She could let you know when the available spots are so we can fill that. And then last but not least, we praise God for a Supreme Court that had the courage to stand up and protect the lives of the unborn. That, in, in Leon Mitchell's words, that's a big deal. That is a big deal. And, and for some of you, there's never been in a time in this country when, when abortion wasn't a woman's right. And, and I remember when that day happened. And, and to somehow, for somehow for the narrative to have been reframed over a number of years to the place where it's about a woman's choice and it's not about the unborn's right to live. It's just unconscionable to me. And so we praise God for the court. We praise God for their courage and their willingness. You may disagree politically, and that's okay. I'm going to stand strong as an advocate of the voice of the unborn. So we praise God for that decision. And please, 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 everyone you can, uh, reach out. 
congressman, your senator, whoever, and let them know how much you appreciate the courage the Supreme Court had. And, and the battle's not over. There's going to be more fights and, and more state legislatures coming up. So we need to continue to keep that in our prayers. Amen? I mean, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming. Stand with us now, and let's worship the Lord. We get to worship a God this morning that does great things. Amen? But there's a scripture I was reading this morning. It says, this is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. So let's just choose to lift up the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords this morning.
morning I asked Bonnie for you. said it. You accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I followed it up with, that means you letting him be the boss of your life. This morning, if you're in this room, and you, some of you never said, God, I'm going to let you be the boss of my life. can do it right now. 
If you want to talk to somebody about it, you walk up to the front, and I guarantee you somebody will meet you there. But if you're like me, there's days where he's not the boss. You decide you're going to take over. So as we sing that bridge again, it says, Lord, change me like only you can. If you're, if you're like me and you struggle letting him be boss sometimes, I want you to, I want to encourage you just to lift your hands as a sign of surrender. Like, stick your hands up, I surrender all. And we're just going to sing that, that bridge again as a prayer. And, and if, if you got this thing down, I, I want to ask you as we sing this to stretch your hands out to one of us to have our hands up and intercede for us, pray for us. So, Lord, change me like only you can. Here with my heart in your hand, Father, I pray, make me more like Jesus. This world is dying to know who you are. You've shown us the way to your heart. So, Father, I pray, make me more like Let's lay it down if all of you means less of me. Take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. If more of you means less of me, take everything. Yes, all of you is all I need. Take everything. Lord, that's our prayer this morning. Change our hearts. Change us only the way you can, God. God, if that means strip everything from me, that means take all my possessions, that means take all my stuff. That means take my family, God. I, mean, I want to be where you want me, God. Lord, as a church, we come this morning saying we want to be what you want us to be. And that means breaking us to our knees, God, to do it. Bring us together, united with you, God. We love you this morning, God. Open our hearts, Holy Spirit. Stir us the only the way that you can. Open our eyes to what you have this morning, God. We love you, God. In Jesus' amazing, awesome, wonderful, mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Once again, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Those of you on the live stream, thank you for tuning in as well. Kids, time to go to First Kids. If you're visiting with us for the first time and have kids from kindergarten through the fourth grade, they're welcome to follow these guys right over here. I see Miss Tia. You're welcome to go with them to see where they're going. If not, at the end of the service, you can just go right out that door where they are and follow the signs that say First Kids, and they'll take you right to where those kids are. That's good stuff. Super excited about Banu's baptism this morning. By the way, if you're part of her family, if you're here with Banu's family, would you just stand so we can just kind of recognize you? If you're here with her family, that's awesome. Good stuff. Thank you guys so much for, for coming. 
You know, as Theron was talking to her, I was thinking, you know, we, we, we have this language that we use in the Southern Baptist world, and baptisms. And, you know, you're buried with Christ, raised to walk in newness of life. And it's, it's this picture, it's this, it's this symbol of what's happening. And Bonu accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, along with, I think, 12 other young people at VBS. So you'll be seeing a few more of these baptisms coming up in, in the weeks ahead. But at that moment, Banu was changed. Yet, it actually began this, this continuous act of changing that will take place in her life. And it, seem, it seems kind of a, of a complex thought process. How can I be changed and then be changing going forward? But that's exactly what happens. At that moment that we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are changed. The old person is dead. And now we get raised to walk in newness of life. And that newness of life, it sets in, in motion this process, this, this progressive work that we've talked about of sanctification. And, and if you're not familiar with that language, I apologize. It just means becoming more like Jesus. But it's a process, right? The, it would be great if we all just got accepted Christ and just somehow the Holy Spirit just downloaded in us everything we needed to be, everything we needed to know to be a perfect follower of Jesus Christ. Did that happen to anyone? Okay, I'm just making sure I didn't miss out on anything. You know, it's this progressive work. And, and really, in, in this morning's message, which is called Practicing Righteousness, this is really one of the main themes that we're going to find out uh, that Jesus is talking about is, is this, this work, this progressive work that's taking place with us to become more like Jesus. In, 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 in the past several weeks, we've, we've talked a lot about this word righteousness. And, and it's a major theme in, in Matthew's gospel. And just as a reminder, and I'm not going to go back and recap the past 16 weeks that we've been in Matthew so far. But just understand this. Matthew, it, it's the first gospel it, it, as, as presented in Scripture. But Matthew is a gospel that's written by Jews for Jews about a Jewish Messiah. It's written distinctively from a Jewish perspective. There's over and over and over again references to Old Testament uh, scriptures. There's, 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 there's uh, references over and over again to Old Testament prophecies. It's written for Jews. And so we're trying to, to come at this with a 21st century mindset, Gentile, if you will, Western mindset, Christian mindset. And we're trying to put ourselves in this text and understand what Jesus' disciples would have heard when when he was speaking to them and where we're at in the text this morning in Matthew, Matthew 6 is, is what would they have heard? What would a first century Jew have heard when Jesus opened his mouth? So here's a question that I want you to consider. And again, this is just a motif that I've been using lately in, in these messages. I want to give you something to think about. And then as we go through the message, hopefully we begin to answering the question. So here it is. Here's a question for you to consider. In recent weeks, we've defined righteousness as meeting God's standard. Well, you may have, have asked yourself, what exactly does that mean? That's just sort of this nebulous, very general description. I need something more that I can sink my teeth into. I need, give me a bullet points. What does that mean? And we've intentionally left it sort of vague. So in that time, have you thought about what that standard looks like? Have you thought about what does righteousness look like in my life? If I'm supposed to attain to this standard of God, if I'm supposed to be righteous, well, what does that look like? How do I know when I get there? So we're going to talk about this morning because that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and then, then uh, 16 through 18, which is, will be our text today. So what does this word standard mean? Well, standard is something established by an authority, a custom, or a general consent as a model or example. It's not culture standard. We've seen what culture standard can do to a culture, amen? We've seen this progressive graying and blurring of the lines between what is absolutely right and what is absolutely wrong. And thank God, again, that we have a Supreme Court that had the courage to stand up and say, enough is enough. And this should just be the beginning, frankly, ladies and gentlemen. Whose standard do we live by? Whichever, whichever political uh, party happens to be in power in Congress or in the legislature, does it, does it matter which part of the country we live in? Whose standard do we live by? 
Ladies and gentlemen, we have to live by God's standard because God is faithful and God is true and God does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the standard that we live by. And he clearly spoke it and he wrote it down in the Bible for us. All the answers to all the questions that we have culturally, privately, corporately are right here. It's right here in God's Word. It is inerrant. It's without error. It's infallible. It's incapable of error because it's God-breathed. <sighs> Came right out of his mouth. That's the standard. Now, last week, we closed it in, in the message in, in, in Matthew 48, Matthew 5, 48, and, and we, we, I, I intentionally didn't go very deep into this. It says, therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How many perfect people do we have here this morning? I'm not, I'm not raising my hand. I'm just suggesting if you are, you raise your hand. Nobody's going to bite on that one. Any of you out there in the live stream world, would you just raise your hand at home, wave it at us so we can see if you're perfect? Okay, nobody. Well, you talk about a high bar, right? You are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You are to be. It's, it's, a, it's a condition. It's, 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 a, it's a status that we are to strive for. But none of us is there. And, and you understand, when, when you come and, and you look at the, the book of Matthew or any other place in the Bible, the Bible wasn't written with chapters and verses in it, right? You get that. So this is, this, we're in, we're in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. We began in Matthew 5 and now we're in 6 and we're going to be here for weeks. And so it's this, this one continuous thought, this one continuous message that Jesus is preaching. So we, we, we delineate things to make it easy for us to look it up and find where the text is. But Jesus didn't do that when he was speaking. So he's come from talking about being perfect, and now he's going to be talking about practicing righteousness. So there's, a, there's some combination between practicing righteousness and being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. And within that, there's this idea that, that once we follow Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are changed. But that change begins this process of changing, this, this participle, if you will. We are constantly changing. We're becoming more and more and more like him. Or at least we're supposed to be. I'm going to wear myself out. I've got to walk all the way back over here now. So well, let's take a look at that word. What does that word mean? It means brought to its end, finished, or wanting, or lacking nothing necessary to, complete, to completeness. And the word reflects completion or fulfillment. So you, you get this sense that at some point we're going to be perfected. We're going to become complete. We're going to be lacking nothing. Well, when does that happen? Well, it doesn't, lack, it doesn't happen in this, this lifetime. So here's something I want you to consider. So those of you, because I see some new faces out here. When, when I say, when you see up here something to consider, what I'm telling you is this is what I believe to be true. This is what Pastor Charlie believes to be true. You can agree, you can disagree. Maybe it provokes thought and maybe you decide, you know what, I need to look at that a little bit deeper. I'm not so sure I buy what he's saying. That's great. Just because I'm selling it doesn't mean you got to buy it. You need to check out what God says for yourself. But here's what I believe to be true. I believe we obtain righteousness, that is to say we meet God's standard, at the moment the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in us is finished and we lack nothing. Sanctifying, there again, there's this theological word, and I apologize if you're not comfortable with that language. Sanctifying is this progressive work, this progressive, progressive act of us becoming more like Jesus. What does that mean? That's just where we begin to think and act and see the world through the same prism, through the same lens that Jesus did. When we begin to have a, a world view that's informed by Jesus and by God's Word and by the Holy Spirit that lives within us. The moment the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in us is finished and we lack nothing, that's when we obtain righteousness. But I also believe that that same sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit in us is never finished while we're on this earth. 
this act, this progressive work of becoming like Jesus never ends. Banu was changed at the moment she accepted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And she was buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. If anyone is a Christ, they're a new creature. The old has passed away and all things have become new. That's what happened to Banu. But now she's taken the first step in what will be many steps in this process of becoming more like Jesus. And we refer to that as sanctification. It never ends while we're on this earth. So it kind of sets up this, this question, doesn't it? If what I believe is true, if what I just said to you is true, then how can we be perfect? How can we meet God's standard? How can we practice righteousness as Jesus commanded? If this work is never complete in us, if we're always striving to get there, if it's not going to be complete until we get to heaven, then how can we be perfect? So here's what I believe. I believe the answer lies in differentiating between the finished state of our sanctification, which we refer to as glorification in heaven, and Jesus' instructions for us to practice, which occurs here on earth. You have to practice. Anybody here ever play sports? You have to practice. You want to get good at something? You have to practice. You want to develop something further, a skill set. It doesn't have to be sports. It could be anything in your life. If you want to develop something, what do you have to do? You have to work at it. You have to discipline yourself in that field of endeavor, whatever that may be, and that is practice. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 8 and 16 through 18. We're going to kind of break up the, the pericope, if you will, this, this passage of Scripture, and we're going to come back and touch on some other parts later in the series. But practicing righteousness, that's our, that's our topic this morning. So let's take a look. I'm preaching out the New American Standard. I'll, I'll put parenthetically uh, words that are, that are different in other translations or other versions for you. You can follow along in your, in your Bible or in your, your Bible app, or you can watch it on the screen. He begins, beware of practicing your righteousness. Your version may have alms or charitable deeds before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. So what does that word beware mean? It means to attend to or to be attentive to, to turn your mind towards something. Quite literally, it means be aware, pay attention, be on guard. Be conscious, be conscientious of, of these things. And then practice or practicing, it means to act rightly or to do well, to carry out, to execute or perform. So we're to be on guard, we're to pay attention to practicing our righteousness in front of others. And then there's that word righteousness again, the condition that's acceptable to God. Now for the first time in weeks, I've added to that. I've given you the, the, the proverbial bullet points, if you will. Integrity, virtue, purity of, of life, rightness, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting. If you want to know what, what righteousness is, if you want to know what meeting God's standard is, these are some of the things. Am I a man or a woman of, of character? Do I have integrity? Do I live a virtuous life? Pure life? Correctness of thinking? Correctness according to who? According to God's Word. Because that's the standard. And then what about this idea of a reward? Do I practice righteousness in order to get a reward? No, you practice righteousness because you've already received the reward. The response to the love that's been shown through us, the grace that's been shown to us through Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I did not deserve my salvation. And I don't know about you, but there's no way I could have earned my salvation. When it comes to the, to the scales of rightness and wrongness, I'm telling you, <laughs> I, I, there, I, I will never get close in my lifetime to do enough good things to balance out the bad things I've done in my life. 
But here's the good news. I don't have to worry about it. My quest, if you will, my striving to be more like Jesus, my striving to meet the standard, to practice righteousness, is born for the love of God that he already has shown me, not in an effort to earn it. He just gives it. The rewards which God bestows or will bestow are upon good deeds and endeavors. So there is still, ladies and gentlemen, this sense in Jesus' message to, to, to his disciples. There's still this, this sense that if you do these things, if you, if you pursue this life of righteousness, if you, if you pursue this life of, of meeting God's standard, of, of satisfying and pleasing God, then good things will happen. And if you, if you haven't read it in a while, take a look at the book of Proverbs. It's the book of the month, right? There's, there's 31 Proverbs. You can read one a day. The whole book is, is contrasting the life of, of folly and the life of wisdom. And the idea is that if you follow God's precepts and principles, things are going to turn out pretty good for you. But if you choose to pursue your own path, the path of folly, well, things might not prove so to turn out so well for you. So in this idea of practicing righteousness in the verses we're going to look at today, again, Matthew 6, 1 through 8 and 16 through 18, there's three areas that Jesus speaks about. And he begins each one, each of these sort of subsections with this same language. When you pray, or when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. Now let me tell you right now, this idea of meeting God's standard, this idea of practicing righteousness, isn't limited to giving, praying, and fasting. It's not a comprehensive list, however it is a representative list. Let's just say it's a good place to start. So let's see what he has to say, beginning with when you give. We're going to pick it up in verse 2. So when you give to the poor, notice when you give, it's assumed that you're going to be giving. And by the way, we're coming into the, the summer months right now. The June swoon, as it were, for, as far as giving is concerned. And you guys have been such a faithful church throughout the COVID months and ye, or years at this point. By the way, thank you guys so much for the text messages, the, the calls, the meals that were brought by for Kim and I as we, as we added our name to the list of people that had suffered through COVID. We appreciate your love and your prayers and, and those, those gestures so much. So God bless you and thank you for that. But, but even despite all the stuff with COVID, this church, you have been so faithful in giving. And God has blessed this church because of that. And we have a wonderful finance team that has stewarded those resources as well. And so please just encourage you, continue to be faithful in giving. Even though it's summertime, it's like, well, I'm going to take some time off. Continue. So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets. So that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. Now, you know, I kind of geek out on this stuff. I, I just, I just, if there's an expression, if there's a word or something that I don't know or I haven't heard before, I don't understand, I'm going to dig deeper in, into it and, and figure it out. So I looked up this expression, sound a trumpet. So I just thought it was kind of like that, you know, we have this idiom that we use in, in the West of, of tooting your own horn, right? So I thought, well, that's what it means. It means to toot your own horn. Well, it kind of does, but there's a little bit more of a meaning to it that when Jesus spoke to his disciples, they would have understood, and it has to do with the temple. How many of you knew that? Okay, you should have known that because I preached on this about four years ago. But like somebody, well, somebody a, a, a blog post that I read said, two things pastors need to know. People don't remember what you're saying. They don't know what you're thinking. Case in point. So sound a trumpet. What does that mean? Well, David Stern in his Jewish study Bible, he writes, In the temple at this time, there were 13 collection boxes for alms. And they were wide at the bottom and narrow at the top. So kind of just the opposite of this table right here. Wide at the bottom, narrow at the top. And they resembled trumpets. And they, bought, they, they made a recognizable sound as the coins were dropped into them. And often those who wished to boast would drop a large number of coins at once. This was called sounding the trumpet. It was this practice of letting everyone know how much you were giving that Yeshua opposed. 
So picture this. They're at, you're at, the, at the temple. And there's these 13 sort of trumpet-like objects spaced out around. And so somebody comes and they reach into their pocket and they drop a coin in and it goes, chink. But then somebody comes and they take a bucket. <laughs> Just makes this loud, rattle, echoing sound. It's sounding the trumpet. And that's what Jesus was opposed to. In fact, what you're, what you're going to find by the time we get done here in just a few minutes is that, is that everything in, in that Jesus is talking about in practicing righteousness, one of the critical factors to consider is what's my motivation? What is motivating me to do this? Am I doing this like the hypocrites? Am I doing this in the synagogues and in the streets? Am I doing this for public accolade? Or am I doing it as a genuine, heartfelt, sincere response to the love of God? So you had these people that would come, and they wanted to make sure that everybody knew how much money they were given. Did you know that in, in the second temple period, in, in Solomon's temple period, or I'm sorry, the, the Herod's temple that he built, that there was actually a, a place where people could go and give secretly. And there was actually a room where people that needed help could go and get, and get help privately. You know, it's one of the reasons why I, I love at our church that we have a benevolence team. And I love the fact that we, each, each, each quarter when we, when we observe the Lord's Supper on Celebration Sundays, we take a benevolence offering. So people in our church or people in our community can, can privately come to the church and say, I need help. Anybody in this room ever needed help before? Anybody in this room ever feel helpless? That there was no place to go, no place to turn? See, that's, as a cross follower, we don't abide that. There's plenty. There's plenty in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus was criticizing these men, and, and, and ostensibly women too, that made a, made a public farce, if you will, of giving so that everybody would say, oh, wow, look, did you hear how many coins he dropped in there? I don't know how many it was, but it must have been a bunch because it made a big noise. That's sounding the trumpet. Hypocrites. We've talked about this before. A hypocrite is an actor. It's this, it, 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 the same word was used for actor. And it's just someone that's pretending. And that's what Jesus was, was saying about these people. They're just pretending. They're pretending to be, to be benevolent. They're pretending to practice righteousness. But it's all for show. It's all for... It's all to make them look good in the eyes of others. In verse 3, he goes on, he says, But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. There's another one of those idioms. There's one of these expressions. And really what it means is to just be spontaneous. You don't, have to, you don't have to let anybody know what you're doing. Just, just be led by the Holy Spirit is what Jesus is saying. If God impresses upon you to buy the groceries of the people in front of you or the people behind you, then just do it. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to pray about it. As the Holy Spirit leads and guides you to do something, just do it. Nike's made billions out of that slogan, just do it. Why can't the Christ followers just be the same way? As the Holy Spirit leads and guides us, just do it. Don't overthink it. Don't complicate it. If God leads you to do something, just do it. Well, I may not have the money. Why would God tell you to do something that you don't have the money to do? Is God going to tell you to do something that you don't have the ability to do? Well, let me tell you, if he does, it's because he's about to give you the ability to do it. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing, or the left hand know what the right hand's doing. So that your giving will be in secret and your Father who sees what's done in secret will reward you openly. Now we're going to talk about that phrase in secret later on. Six times it's used in these few verses. It's when you practice righteousness, when you give, but also when you pray. When you pray. Did you know that Jesus is assuming that his disciples pray? I know. 
praying. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites. There's that word again. Not like the pretenders, not like the actors, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret rewards you openly. This is not an admonishment against public prayer. We have a very faithful group of people that are here at this church every Monday morning at 7 o'clock. They will be here tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock to pray. It is public prayer. You should join us. There's a difference, though, between public and private prayer. And there's especially a difference in public and private prayer in the first century versus what we tend to think of. Remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get behind the text. We're trying to get ourselves into the text so that we're hearing and understanding what it is Jesus is communicating to his disciples. Again, Stern in his Jewish study Bible, he says, In first century Judaism, there were two main approaches to prayer. The public prayer of temple and synagogue and private prayer. Public prayer was formal. The style was highly elaborate, deferential, and conducted in a series of benedictions in Hebrew. So you had this this public prayer at the temple and in the synagogue, and everything was scripted out. It was all rote. It was what we would refer to today, it was very liturgical. And there's nothing wrong with scripted out or or those verses, but, but it has to be more than that. Because see, what happens when you come in and somebody slaps a piece of paper in your hand and says, here's what we're going to pray today. You just read it. And there's no heart. There's no sincerity. There can be. But the tendency is to just be very mechanical. And that's what Jesus was, was talking about. You had guys that knew these prayers. They've been practicing these prayers their whole life. They could say these prayers with such cadence and such eloquence. And, the, and, and their voice would just carry. They would draw attention to themselves. And that's not what public prayer is all about. It's about drawing attention to God. In contrast, private prayer was informal. It was direct, uttered in the vernacular, in a way of praying that all could use. It did not require, as it were, any professional expertise or training. And as a Torah observant Jew, Yeshua or Jesus faithfully attended temple and synagogue. He was not teaching against public prayer, but rather stressing the need for intimacy with God. Ladies and gentlemen, our prayer life must be grounded in the foundation of intimacy with God. Can you think of anything more important than spending quality time with God? Well, he's spirit, and I'm flesh. He's in heaven, and I'm here. How do I spend quality time with God? In prayer. In prayer. Even in public prayer, there can be intimacy with God if there is, this is a Hebrew word, kavana, a faith-filled focus on the Holy One. So again, I, 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 it's just how I'm wired. I had to look up and see what this word means. This word, kavanah, this is from reformjudaism.org. It's one's personal intention or direction of the heart when praying or performing mitzvot. Mitzvot is a commandment of God. The intentions and devotions individuals bring to their own prayer. So you can pray publicly and you can pray privately, but if your heart's not there, if your motivation is not to, to long to be close to God, to long to be brought into His presence, to commune with the Father, to, to pour out our, our heart's greatest desires and cares and concerns, the worries that we have, to pour those out before God and know that He hears our prayer and know that He's moved to action, that's Kavanaugh. And that's what we have to have in prayer, whether it's Monday morning corporate prayer or public prayer, or whether it's your private individual prayer time. Where's my heart? What's my motivation? Am I praying to God just so I can check it off the list? Am I praying to God because He is my source and my sufficiency in all things?
Ladies and gentlemen, we need to pray for our members of our Supreme Court. We need to pray for the members of Congress. We need to pray for members of our state legislatures because this is all going to end up in the states. And some states, as you've already heard, have these trigger laws that have already kicked into effect and praise God for it. Frankly speaking, this is not a paid public announcement or political announcement. It's just a private political announcement. I didn't think they went far enough. I think they just need to ban abortion across the board outright. Because no matter how you carve it up, it's taking the life of an innocent. It's taking the life of someone. And I, yes, I believe that life begins at the moment of conception. What's my heart? What's my motivation in praying? What's my motivation in giving? What's my motivation in fasting? What's my motivation? Am I just trying to impress people? Am I just trying to impress myself? Or am I just acknowledging my fallibility, my frailty, my fallenness before the great and awesome God and saying, God, I can't do this by myself. I need you. Jesus continues in verse 7. He says, And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. I almost didn't include that, those verses here because I was going to include them when we talk about the Lord's Prayer, which would happen next in this, this series. But there's a right way to pray and there's a wrong way to pray. There's a right condition of our heart. There's a lot of things that, that enter into prayer and our ability for our prayers to be heard by God. And we've preached on that over and over again in the past. Sometimes I think we have the sense that if I just pray louder or if I just pray better or maybe if I script it out and repeat it over and over and over again that it'll get through to God. And I think what's really true, ladies and gentlemen, is that when our heart is right before God and when our motivation is right before God, that he hears our prayer before we even ask it. He knows exactly what we have need of. Well, if he knows what I have need of, why do I have to pray? Because he wants to know that you know that he's your sufficiency. That he's the source for the answer to whatever you're praying about. We practice righteousness when we give. We practice righteousness when we pray. And we practice righteousness when we fast. We're going to skip down to verses 16 through 18. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face. As the hypocrites do. There's that word again. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. Go back a slide for me, Jake, would you please? I, I, I believe it's the King James Version. Some, many of you have that version right now. I believe it's King James or maybe the NIV that actually uses the word disfigure their faces. Disfigure their faces. See, that's, that, that's, that's this pretty significant change because it's one thing, it's one thing to sort of passively not do anything to enhance your appearance, but it's another thing to very actively do something to disfigure yourself, to make yourself look worse than you really are. And you get the sense that these actors, these hypocrites, these pretenders, that that's what they're doing. Well, I'm fasting, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up my hair. I'm going to walk around with my lips all, or cheeks all sunk in. Oh, I'm fasting. Pray for me. I can't keep my clothes on. 
it, it's funny, right? Just the, just the thought of it, it it's, it, it's, it's comical. But that's what, that's what actors do. That's, that's what they do. They, they present something that's not true. They, they act in order to elicit a response, to engage their audience. And that's what these men were doing. Don't put on a gloomy face, for they neglect their appearance. They disfigure their faces so that they'll be noticed by men when they're fasting. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head. Brill cream, a little dab will do you. Wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men but by your Father who is in secret. And there's that expression again. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. I like what John MacArthur has to say about fasting. And we, we've taught on fasting a number of times. Those of you that may be visiting with us, every January we, we begin the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. So, so leading up to that, I teach on fasting each year so that we understand what fasting is and what fasting isn't. Here's what John MacArthur says. He says, Jesus' statement when you fast indicates that fasting is normal and acceptable in the Christian life. Now, this would have been a great place for me to insert a question to consider, to ask you to consider among yourself, what is your practice with fasting? And maybe I should have. Because I think Jesus anticipates that his followers will fast. Just as he anticipates that you'll give, just as he anticipates that you'll pray, he anticipates that you will fast. He assumes his followers will fast on certain occasions, but he doesn't give a command or specify a particular time, place, or method. In every scriptural account, genuine fasting is linked with prayer. Read that again. Read that on the, on the screen behind me. In every scriptural account, genuine fasting is linked with prayer. You can't have fasting without prayer, ladies and gentlemen. Your fasting should be a time of consecrated, dedicated, committed prayer. Whatever it is you're fasting for, you pray for that thing while you're fasting. You can pray without fasting, but you cannot fast biblically without praying. Fasting is an affirmation of intense prayer, a corollary of deep spiritual struggle before God. Fasting is also linked with a pure heart, must be associated with obedient, godly living. There's that idea of of my motivation and my heart again, this idea of this Kavanaugh again. What's my heart? What's my motivation in fasting, Jesus is saying or asking. There can be no right fasting apart from a right heart, right living, and a right attitude. Sure, you can go through the motions. You can Google fasting, and there's all all kinds of information about the health benefits of intermittent fasting. There's all kinds of of, of things out there about fasting, but, but when you're fasting before God, if your heart's not in the right place, you are wasting your time. It's the same with your prayer life. If your heart's not in the right place, you are wasting your time. You're just speaking words. You're making yourself feel good, but God is not hearing you if your heart is not in the right place. I'm just telling you. Jesus' point was that a person who fasts should do everything to make himself look normal and do nothing to attract attention to his deprivation and spiritual struggle. Jesus is is given to his disciples. It's this, it's this primer for, for practicing righteousness. It's this primer for meeting God's standard. And six times in these verses, he uses this expression, in secret. So what does that mean? What is, when he talks about in secret, what is he talking about? When MacArthur writes about that, he says, Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has specifically commanded, Let your light shine before men in such a way that they can see your good works. Glorify your Father who is in heaven. That was in Matthew 5, 16. Remember, as a church, we sang, This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. 
you could have just joined in with me right there instead of leaving me hang out here to dry. The question is not whether or not our good works should be seen by others, but whether or not they're done for that end. There's nothing wrong with people knowing that you're doing good things for the church, for the community, for the country, for the nation. There's nothing wrong with that. But if your motivation is in doing those good things is so people will notice if you or notice you, that's the problem. It's not that somebody knows, it's that you're doing it so that they'll know. Do you see that distinction? It's a matter of the heart. It's this Kavanaugh idea all over again. When they're done in such a way that attention and glory are focused on our Father in heaven rather than ourselves, God is pleased. But if they're done to be noticed by men, they're done self-righteously and they're rejected by God. Now, it doesn't mean that the good thing that you did still didn't benefit somebody. It probably did. But it's not recognized by God. Because your heart was not in the right place when you did it. We have people that, that are very committed to serving in, our, in the community. They're, they serve in, in all different ways. But their motivation for doing that is so that people will say, hey, would you look at him? Gosh, what a great guy. He should be citizen of the year. But his heart's not right before God because he's doing it for the attention, for all the wrong reasons. The difference is the purpose of motivation. The one who sincerely wants to please God will studiously avoid trying to impress men. As followers of Jesus Christ, the world should see us do things that differentiate or set us apart from the rest of the world. They should see us doing good things. But they should see us doing good things because our heart wants to do good things for people because our heart breaks for people because of their lostness. They should see us doing good things for people because we're doing it because God has told us to do it and because we want to please God and we don't care what, it, what kind of sacrifice it takes on our part. That's why we do good things. That's why we differentiate ourselves from the rest of the world. But if we're doing it to be noticed by the rest of the world, then that just makes us no different than them. So how do I practice righteousness? And we're almost done. How do I practice righteousness? Well, this is straight out of the text. We practice giving. Always check your motivation. In fact, always check your motivation should just sort of be one above all the, all, uh, for all of these. Your giving should always be other-focused, not on you. Whether you're giving to the church, whether you're giving in the community, whether you're giving to your neighbor, however you're giving, it should always be focused on meeting someone else's need. It should always be directed by the Holy Spirit. And then the second thing is don't make a big deal out of your giving. Don't make a big deal out of it. Is it okay that somebody knows that I tithe or give offerings? Sure. Sure. In fact, we've talked about these com uh, committee positions, you know, our finance committee position. You, 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 you don't really have a right to serve on a finance committee or a deacon in this church or an elder in this church if you don't give to this church. You disqualify yourself. But don't make a big deal out of it. Well, does he know how much money I give to this church? No. Does he care how much money I give to this church? No. Because you're not giving to the church, you're giving to God. That's between you and God. I have nothing to say about it. So how about practicing praying? How do I do that? Publicly, don't draw attention to yourself. Privately, have sincere intimate conversations with God. There's nothing like sitting down with that person that you love more than anything in the world and just having a sincere, 
intimate conversation. And I got to tell you, when, you know, I, I've mentioned this before. When Kim was in Israel for, for those two weeks, I struggled. Because I, I didn't have my best friend. I didn't have that person that I can just sit down and, and just unwind, unburden to. She was, she was not there. And that's not the same thing. Have sincere, intimate conversations with God. Don't be mechanical or rote. I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a list of, of people you pray for and things. I think that's important. But don't let your prayer life become so mechanical or so rote that it's just reading words off a page. And don't repeat empty words and phrases. And as far as fasting is concerned, try not to be noticed. Now it's, it's, no, it's no surprise, it's no shock, it's no great announcement that in January I, I fast and pray for 21 days. And I'm an old fat man, so at the end of the 21 days I've usually lost, you know, 20 or 30 pounds or whatever, so people notice it. I, do, I can't help that. But I don't fast because I want you to notice how much weight I've lost. I don't fast so that you think I'm some kind of spiritual giant. I fast because I believe that's what God would have me to do. If I'm going to ask our church to fast and pray for 21 days, wouldn't it make sense for the leader of the church to fast for 21 days? Try not to be noticed. Don't neglect your physical appearance. Get up. Take a shower. Teenagers, comb your hair. Shave. Do the things you usually do. Put on a happy face. Can you do that? Put on a happy face. Darren, you, you're close, I'm pretty sure. We began with the question, have you thought about what that standard looks like? Righteousness, the definition of meeting God's standard. Have you thought about what that looks like? So here's something I want to consider, you to consider as we close. I believe the things we practice, both consciously and subconsciously, are the things we make permanent. The things we practice, both consciously and subconsciously, are the things we make permanent. I believe as we strive to be more like Jesus, we must practice righteousness. And a great place to start is to practice giving, praying, and fasting. Next week, we're going to talk about did you remember the deposit? We'll just let you think about that between now and then. Being a follower of Jesus Christ is not an easy thing. It begins with a moment of decision where you say yes to Jesus. As Bonnie said, where when you get to make Jesus the boss of your life, when you surrender to Jesus as both your Savior and your Lord, it begins at that moment. Your life is changed forever at that moment, that moment in time. But that change in that moment begins this process of, of changing that will take place throughout the rest of your life. And Jesus wants us to become more like him. He wants us to begin to see and sense the world through the eyes and through the ears that, that, that he does and he has. And when, when something happens in the world, and, and my gosh, something's always happening in the world, he wants us to feel the things that he feels. And because we feel the things that he feels, he, he wants us to be stirred to action. He wants us to be, become his agents of change on this earth. He wants us to do the things that he would do if he was here. And see, that's what he's trying to communicate to his disciples. When you practice righteousness, it's not, about, it's not about what other people see you do. It's about your heart. And the biggest thing that happened for Banu and those other 12 kids that got saved during VBS was they had a heart change at that moment. 
their heart told them that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and God raised him from the dead. And their heart told them that they were a sinner, that they were separated from God, and that the smartest thing they could possibly do was to surrender that broken heart to God and let Him heal it so that they could be restored to that right relationship with God so that they could inherit all those wonderful things that God intended for them to have from the very beginning. And now they get to practice becoming more like Jesus. We are being changed by the Holy Spirit within us and the Spirit of Christ. We're becoming more like Him. And I have to believe, ladies and gentlemen, that if, if we take seriously this idea of practicing righteousness, then we become more and more like Him. Then we begin to see the world more and more like He does. And we begin to be stirred to action more and more like He did. And I believe that we can make a profound difference in our community. We can change our community. We can change the world. But it begins with us. It begins like Banu, recognizing our need for a Savior and calling upon His name and being saved. In essence, telling Jesus, Jesus, take my life. Take my life. You shape my life. You take my life. You make it what you want it to be. If a 10-year-old girl can do that, why can't you? So we're going to take just a minute and worship. We're going to sing a song called Take My Life. And I want you to stand with us if you would. If you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you do that this morning? All you have to do is take a step of faith. All you have to do is step out. Those of you that are on the live stream, all you have to do is click that connect card that's right there and say, I need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and we will contact you. If you need prayer this morning, would you just come down and let us pray for you? Let's practice righteousness right here. Let's, let's come down of, of, a, of a right heart and a right spirit and let's just pray. Let us pray for you. Let us intercede on your behalf. You can come and you can just kneel down here and pray by yourself if you want to. Or if you want someone to pray with you, we'll pray with you. What's, what's God leading you to do this morning? What's he asking of you? Just say yes. Whatever he says. Continue that process with the Holy Spirit of being changed to be more like him. There. Sing with us. The righteousness, the righteousness is what I long for. Let's meet God standing. The righteousness is what I need. Let's allow him to perfect us. The righteousness, the righteousness is what you want from me.
thank you for joining us this morning. And our prayer every week is that we don't just hear the word, but we walk out and do the word that we've heard this morning. So I just pray this as you leave today, that you just take this pursuit of righteousness with you. That you take this pursuit of prayer, fasting, chasing after God seriously. Tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, there will be a group of people here public praying together, and you're, you're more than welcome and invited to be a part of that. We just thank you for joining us today. We, we're so glad you're here. If you'd like to talk with any of us, feel free to come up here. We will meet you up here at the altar in the office, anywhere, and just visit with you and pray with you. We thank you very much. Y'all have a wonderful week and enjoy the cool weather today. Amen. Y'all have a good day. Take my